fun. And at long last, we're starting um, a very special uh, program here at Revolution Books. And I want to welcome people in the audience here in person, people who are outside sitting in uh, the chairs uh, in front of the store. And I want to welcome the live stream audience. Our, our program today is new fiction from the African diaspora with authors Wanjiku Wangugi and Mukoma Wangugi. Um, they are going to be debuting their new novels. Uh, Mukoma's novel is um, Unbury Our Dead with Song, and Wanjiku's novel is Seasons in Hippoland. This is the second uh, of our two collaborations um, this year, this summer fall, with the Brooklyn Book Festival. And um, I want to give a special welcome to people who are here from the festival and people who are watching online from the festival. Revolution Books is a bookstore about the world for a radically different world. And a central part of our mission is to bring forward the literary, cultural, and political voices of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and the diasporas from those regions of the world, diasporas that have everything to do with the historical and ongoing domination, oppression, and plunder of those regions of the world by Western and US imperialism in particular. Um, this afternoon, as I said, we're going to um, debut Seasons in Hippoland, written by Wanjiku Wa Ngugi, and Unbury Our Dead with Song by Mukoma, Mukoma Wa Ngugi. Mukoma is here in person, and he'll uh, be speaking from this podium, and also available to sign copies of the book, uh, which. Uh, <laughs> We're very happy that we received yesterday. Wanjiku is joining us uh, by Zoom. And uh, she's, uh, I believe, in Atlanta right now. Uh, but we're all part of the program. We're all bonded with each other. Mm -hmm. And um, this is going to be um, very, very uh, exciting and stimulating. Um, the format is going to be, um, we're going to start with uh, Wanjiku. She's going to comment on and uh, read from her book. Uh, that'll be followed by uh, Mukoma, who is going to uh, talk about his book, read passages from it. So let me tell you a little bit about Wenjiku. Uh, she grew up in Kenya, uh, received degrees from uh, New York University and MFA from the University of Houston. Um, she has lived and worked in Eritrea, Zimbabwe, and Finland. Um, she was the founder of and uh, the former director of the Helsinki African Film Festival. She's written um, numerous essays, short stories, and her first novel, uh, The Fall of Saints, was published in 2014. She is the daughter of the internationally acclaimed uh, author and voice of conscience, um, Gugi Tiango. And we are very, very thrilled to have Wenjiku with us uh, by Zoom from Atlanta. And I hand the program over to you. So um, I was just thanking Raymond earlier and saying that I really wanted to be there in person, but I, I, I couldn't. Um, but, you know, like he said, we're all in this together. And so I'm, I'm just going to read from um, different parts of the novel. Um, and I, uh, so Seasons in Hilfoland is really a novel about, um, it's really a novel about storytelling, um, freedom, identity, resistance, and, and so forth. So in the section that I'm going to read, so what happens is that what triggers the, the story is that Mombi is rebellious, and so her parents decide to send her and her brother to Hippoland um, to live with their aunt, you know, and she tells, them, she tells them all kinds of stories. And the first story she tells them is, is actually kind of her reminiscing about their grandparents, 
right? So um, uh, let me know if you can't hear me. I'll keep glancing up to see if we're still good with the sound and all that. Um, grandma died from loneliness. She and Grandpa Tito had been involved in the War of Independence. Grandpa was a guerrilla fighting in the mountains. He never returned alive from the war. There was a picture of Grandpa on Grandma's nightstand in her two-bedroom stone house in Hippoland. A young man in khaki clothes who looks nothing like my father. His cheekbones sharp, his face hard, his mouth grim as if the words he spoke were hard words. His eyes were resolute. People said many things about him at his funeral, about Grandma too, when it was her turn to be buried beside him. Grandma loved Hippoland, but she loved Grandpa more. Every time she visited him in the mountains, she put her life at risk. She always took along a size of basket, packed to the brim. It was heavy, so she carried it on her back, the straps firmly around her head. She would walk past the armed police at the checkpoint, past the invaders patrolling the streets, the Luger pistols bulging out of their pockets, or AK-47s mounted on their trucks. Sometimes she just shut her eyes tight and walked right through clouds of tear gas. Usually, no one ever bothered her until she got to the last checkpoint, at the boundary between the occupied land of Londonshire and the start of the forest over which the invaders had no control. The guerrillas called it the liberated zone. That is where the hippos were rumored to have escaped and, for, and from where they sometimes, and from where sometimes they emerged, where General K. Thunder and the freedom fighters and now Grandpa had gathered and made plans that eventually shook all the occupied valleys to the core. At that last checkpoint, those who fought for Queen and Empire would stop her and demand to see her passbook that gave her permission to stride around the land on which she was born. She would stand before the guards unflinching, a red scarf around her neck, a sweater shielding her from the chill of the cool morning air. She would show them her passbook, then the size of basket full of hot fire po roasted potatoes, and they would let her through. A woman with fire roasted potatoes was not a threat to the empire. As soon as she crossed onto the path that led to the forest, she would walk faster, one step, two steps, three steps, then break into a run. A one-hour walk took her 15 minutes, and at its end would be Grandpa waiting for her. It was because of her that he knew he would stay and see the fight through. Sometimes the monsoon blew in too hard, and his bones felt its cold whip. The fighters would cover him with blankets they would meet in their forest hideouts. Sometimes they covered his feet with so many socks he could barely wear his shoes and join them on their mission. Sometimes the cold would suck the heat out of his blood, cause his body to stiffen and blow the viruses in. The freedom fighters would give him extra portions of soup then, so he could get strong again. The heat was cruel to him too. When the southwest monsoon retreated to the Bay of Bengal, the heat snaked in through the trees and coiled around Grandpa. When the sweating made it difficult for him to breathe, the fighters would douse him with water from the marshland, collected on their night missions when the invaders were asleep. It would have been easier to sneak him in and baptize him in the waters of the Landonshire Lake, to cleanse him so that he could, like Moses, lead their escape into their promised land. But the chemicals in Landonshire Lake would have killed him. Yet every hardship only father hadn't his resolve, and so he stayed. Besides, as long as he had grandma's love, nothing could cause him harm. When he touched her face, when he unwound the scarf from around her neck and stood beside her, right there in the forest, then despite the cold and the heat and the rain of bullets, despite her being pregnant with their first and only child, despite the fire roasted potatoes growing cold, Grandpa stuck to his resolve, and so he stayed. As they held each other and renewed their oath of mutual allegiance, General K. Thunder and the freedom fighters stood a little distance away. They wanted some fire roasted potatoes, but even more, they wanted what lay beneath them. After she handed them each a potato, Grandma would reach down to the bottom of her sisal basket and pull out the carefully concealed Luger pistols she had carried all the way. All right, so I'm gonna stop there and I will. So, so Mombi and her brother, as I said, are exiled in, in Hippoland. And so, and, and she occupies their evenings by telling them stories, sometimes fake, some, I mean, she makes them up on the spot, some are real, some are fantasy. And, um, but in the, this particular part I'm reading is um, 
Mombi and Mito decide to, you know, during the day they venture out on their own and to explore Hippolong. So um, they happen upon a, you know, railway railway trucks and then decide to get on the tra- inside the train and see, you know, what's what, just check it out, I suppose. <laughs> and then, uh, unfortunately, this one time, uh, Mombi forgets to get out on time, so the train moves on along with her, you know. So, um, so I have no ticket. I have no money with which I can buy a ticket, and I'm all along. Londonshire, the next stop is an hour away. I can get off there, take a train going to Westville, and get off at Hippoland. One hour to get there, one hour to come back. That's two hours. I have to survive two hours somehow. For more than the time, it's where I'm going that makes my heart pound. I'm on the train to Londonshire, just like Aunt Sarah all those years ago. So now, like Sarah, I'm in a train all alone. Sarah was seven. I'm slightly more than twice her age. She had a ticket. I don't. She had a mother waiting for her at the end of the ride. I have no one waiting for me when the train pulls in at Londonshire. I force myself to relax. Once again, I hear Aunt Sarah's voice, soft at first, then growing clearer, drawing closer, telling me more stories about Londonshire and the country and the fight for the land about the day the country changed from Queensland to Victoriana, the day the Green Barretts bowed to the Queen, then saluted her and sang to her. Then they marched off. When they marched back in, they had changed into the Red Barretts, and then they danced for one nation and bowed to the Empire of Victoriana. The Red Barretts arrested my father and burnt down the football field in Hippoland. I want my heart to slow down so it could help me control the fear filling up my lungs, making my legs and my arms and then my whole body feel as heavy as stone. Fear has weight. Fear is a rock. Fear is a mountain. I close my eyes and try to breathe calmly, to focus on my arms and legs, to move them a little up and down and side to side, as Ansara had taught me once, to help quell the fear, to shift the energy from my heart to my limbs, then from inside me to somewhere outside. I keep my eyes closed and breathe and feel the train latch on and on and on until finally it stops. I open my eyes. I get up. I stagger outside onto the platform. I'm in Londonshire. But am I in Londonshire now or back in Londonshire then? I can't believe my eyes. My head spins and my tummy clenches. The soldiers, the green barracks, they're here on the platform right in front of me, pacing up and down, looking at the passengers. Each has a Luger pistol tucked in at his waist. I see the tall one, the one who summoned young Sarah the moment she stepped onto the platform, asked for her papers that allowed her to travel to Londonshire. She's only seven, her mother says. She's come to visit me. I'm gainfully employed in a household here. Where is her passbook then? Rose takes it out of her bag and holds it out. But there is a problem. Rose's passbook is stamped Hippoland. What is she doing in Londonshire with a passbook that says she was born in Hippoland? The green birds march them off to a room behind the station. I follow. A stale smell hits me as soon as I walk in. A fan spins loudly. The white paint on the walls is peeling off in strips. In the middle of the cement floor is a wooden table. To the side, a set of drawers. Next to it, a wooden bench. Sarah is made to sit there and watch Rose as she stands in front of the table looking at the green barret. I watch Sarah watching Rose, watching the green barret man. The room is cold. Rose's eyes are full of fear, but she answers as calmly as she can every question that is backed out at her. Then the green barret stands up, tells Rose and Sarah to follow him, and, take, and takes them out the back door to yet another room where, the more, where more green barrets are marching up and down and saluting the portrait of a queen they will actually never meet in their lives. They march in two columns. The columns stop when Rose and Sarah arrive. Sarah is made to stand aside. Rose is made to stand in front of the soldiers. At a sign from the tall man, the green bears take out their lugas and point them straight at Rose. Then the tall man comes to Sarah and hands her a pistol. It's too big for her to hold, but he forces her little hands around it. The gun was so cold, so heavy. The tall man drags her to her feet makes her stand in front of her mother and point the gun at her. He lifts her hands to make sure the gun is in line with the mother's heart. Sarah does not want to look at her mother. 
She closes her eyes tight. She hears the men laughing. The tall man presses her finger on the trigger. It hurts because he's pressing so hard. She's determined to never open her eyes again, not even when the man pushes her finger even harder and the gun makes a loud click. She stands there, deaf and dumb and blind. One minute, two minutes, a lifetime. All right. Um, I think I still have time. I'm tired. I'm going to, um, so at some point in the novel, uh, Moonbi starts uh, telling stories and she ends up in prison. So um, I'll just read an excerpt of her in, in prison. I wake up sweating. I'm cold and hot at the same time. My arms are covered with goosebumps. I pull the flimsy sheet up closer. I shut my eyes again and wait for a memory to come, to comfort me. But today is all dark. Nothing comes. Nobody, not even the hippos. I drift off again. Sometimes eyes open, sometimes shut. Somewhere between dream and reality. I feel heavy. I feel light. I think I can fly. I sit up and spread my arms wide. My legs feel heavy, yet when I stand, my feet are firmly planted on the ground. The ground is firm, yet is it? I feel it move and shift and turn and slowly spin. Then faster. I can't stand anymore. I fall like the tortoise who fell from the sky and cracked his shell. I try to raise my head, but it feels like a rock. My body feels different, too, as though it isn't mine. I have become an other. I'm in two minds. I'm, o- I'm Mombi. I'm also Ha. Because I'm Ha, I now live and in people. I'm no longer matter. I'm air, like the wind I flow through Hippoland, to the cardboard houses, to the people's hearts and lives and minds and memory, across the fields and through the trees and down to the lagoon where the hippos come. I open my eyes, but I'm trapped halfway between reality and dreaming. My head is filled with the beating of drums. I try and stop the sound by pulling the sheet over my head. And Sarah's voice starts to rise, tells me the old familiar stories, her words booming even louder than the drum beats. Suddenly I snap wake, fully awake, I'm freezing, I'm lying on a block of ice. I so badly want to see the sun. Warmth, I need its warmth. Who am I now, Mombi or Sarah? That's what I want to ask the sun. When did the sun first see me? And does the sun know who I really am? But when will I be free? When will I have a chance to see the sun again? I wait for the God. She comes three times a day with my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It doesn't matter that all three meals are the same boiled mash. I sit up and make a conscious effort to block my thoughts. They're not serving me well, and I don't want to take counsel from them until I speak to the sun. I need the guard. I look at my fingers and my toes and then touch the knots in my hair, touch the bantu knots in my hair. But I don't want to consult them because even they have got entangled with her. I look at the walls which I lean on from time to time, but I know but I now not but I know not to ask them but I know not to ask anything of them just now. I know they've been stealing some of my memory. Somewhere buried in them is a the memory of the sun. I need that memory now. I need the guard. The floor is filling with water. I don't know where it's coming from. My feet get wet. Is the water coming from my eyes? I see so many people. Maybe it's their sorrow that threatens to drown me now. I wait and wait and wait for the guard. I hear footsteps. She's coming. As soon as she opens the door, I want to warn her about the water and ask about the sun and tell her that I'm trapped in the memory of a woman. But the words are stuck in my throat. She stares at me. Her eyes widen. She puts the food on the floor and asks me to hold up my hands. I feel the cold handcuffs snap around my wrists. She opens the door of my cell, and I follow her out, down the hall. I hear noises and sighs and voices, and then I'm flooded by light. People talk of seeing a light when they're about to meet God, of walking down a tunnel of light to a place where the sun shines eternally, where the air is filled with peace and contentment. I walk down the tunnel. I come out onto a green field. I sit on the grass and feel the sun shining on me, and I, I feel myself growing warm. I bask in its flow. I'm outside after so long. I can smell the grass, the flowers. I can smell freedom. Right. So um, I think that's it. I'll, I'll let Mukama um, come, 
carry on and um, we'll take it after he's done the reading. The Rise of the African Novel. He himself has written uh, three previous novels, um, including Nairobi Heat, and two books of poetry. Uh, his, um, um, and um, he has also authored articles, opinion pieces that have appeared in The Guardian of London, The Los Angeles Times, and Al Jazeera. Uh, Mukoma is a, uh, a dear friend of Revolution Books. He's appeared here two times before. Mm -hmm. And he is uh, the son of the internationally acclaimed writer and voice of conscience, uh, Bugiwa Tiango. And um, a particular factoid for today, this is uh, Mukoma's first public appearance uh, since the pandemic uh, to present his work. <laughs> so uh, we're very excited about that. And. Uh, through thick and thin. He made it to the store this afternoon. <laughs> so uh, I turn the stage over to Mukoma Wa Ngugi. Yeah, so this, this is my first live appearance um, since the pandemic, you know, and I'm glad that my first time out is um, at Revolution Books uh, because of what Revolution Books re re represents, right? um, you know, political consciousness, being part of the community. You know, and then also for holding events like this. And thank you, Raymond, for the introduction. Uh, my ego has missed being introduced, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, and also, of course, it was nice to see Shiko Wajiko, my sister. We haven't seen each other since the pandemic, actually. So even though it's just, you know, on the screen and we talk every now and then, it, it was also nice to be, uh, to share uh, this platform, platform with her. Um, you know, it would have been even, you know, I, I don't know if my dad is watching, but we have done events, the three of us. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so we are family of writers. So it's, it's good that we have novels coming out at the same time. <laughs> 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 oh, in fact, sometimes we joke and say that, uh, you know, that it, we should be in the Guinness Book of Records for having the most published authors from the same family. Cause, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I think five, five of us now are, are, are published authors right, from the same family. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, so the book can bury our dead with some. It's about um, Tizita, right? And you, you've got to listen to some Tizita. And sorry for being late. I mean, you know, I was driving from Ithaca and I haven't, um, you know, I'm coming from a small city. I, I was joking with a friend and saying, <laughs> it's like being a farmer boy. <laughs> 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 so I completely miscalculated timing and everything. But, so thank you for staying. Yeah, but really my deep apologies. Uh, I, I do pride myself on being on time. Well, except for my first gig in two years. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's the, the, the novel is about the Kizita. It's a form of music, uh, but it's not, it, it's not like American, uh, African-American blues right? or Malian blues. Uh, it's one particular song that has many, many interpretations from different musicians. Right? So, and if, if you're interested in this, I, I did make a playlist of the songs I was listening to uh, when I was writing the book. So you can look it up, just at Mukama Kizita playlist, and you'll find the songs. Yeah, so, so um, it, I think of it almost like a sonnet, right? You know, you have a form, right? You have what a sonnet should do, uh, and yet uh, you have all these different ways of, 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 of writing it, and in this case, of singing the Tizita. Um, what happened to me was uh, I lived in Boston. First, I have to wonder I can talk about the Tizita all day, <laughs> but I lived in Boston uh, in the early 2000s, and uh, I had some Ethiopian friends. Um, and we went to a party, right? We went to a party, and uh, somebody played the Tizita, right? Only at that point I didn't know it was the Tizita. I just listened, I just had this song. Then it stayed on my mind, you know. Then one or two days later, I went looking for this song. But those were the days of tape cassettes, and you know, so I could never find it. But I kept asking anybody I could find, you know, what is this song? What is this song? <laughs> so, so I looked for it for many years. Um, but it wasn't until 2012, so maybe 10, 10, 10 years or so later, that when I was applying for a job at, um, at Cornell University, one of my colleagues, or soon to be colleagues, uh, had, written a, had written an essay. So and I was just following up on what people are doing. And when, when I read his essay, I realized, oh, this is it. This is what I've been looking for all these years. This is the visit I've been looking for. Um, you know, and then from there, I started listening and listening. Then I decided, okay, what if, you know, what if I could what if I could take everything I have as a poet, right, and, uh, and also as a writer, 
uh, as, as a person who thinks politically as well. What if I could take everything that I am, let me put it that way, right, and apply that to uh, apply that to the Tivita, right? And how 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 would that come across? So so the plot of the novel follows a journalist called um, uh, called uh, Manfredi, right, who discovers uh, who discovers the Tivita. Right. There's a competition at, at, in, in a Nairobi boxing club. Uh, I'll save that story for those who buy the book. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, anyway, he gets to listen to this competition of the Tizita, and uh, he decides he really must follow the musicians back to Ethiopia. He's a tabloid journalist, right? Uh, he himself comes from a family of... of um, sometimes, I, yeah, I, I was going to say sometimes I, I do write about characters I wouldn't get along with. Anyway, he comes from a well, from a, from <laughs> <laughs> you know, he comes from the other side of politics. You know, uh, Chico, uh, Chico's book talks about this, in, in a, you know, because we grew up in a dictatorship, right? So Manfredi is a character for whom his parents were part of the dictatorship, right? So, but it becomes part of his own search, right? It becomes part of his own search for his um, for his for, for his place in Kenyan and African politics and so on and so forth. Um, so anyway, I want to read, uh, to read three passages. Um, the first one is, oh yeah, and I wanted to say that I'm glad I'm here for, the, for my first live gig, but I've done other gigs where it, it, it's been online. You know, and the question I, 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 I'd been asking myself is, you know, because writers, you know, we enjoy being out and about, right? You know, <laughs> when the book is out, right? You know, so having a book come out during a pandemic isn't as much fun, right? <laughs> 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 you know, but uh, well, on the other hand, though, I started thinking, um, what could be what could be a better pandemic book if you want to call it that, right? But it, the, what could be a better book than one that's dealing with beauty and music, right? And ultimately, as you know, a, a, to my mind, um, a homage to African beauty and aesthetics, right? You know, what what could be a better book for us to be to be reading? Of course, I wrote it. I'll say that and you'll judge when you, when you read the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the scene I'm going to read uh, is from. Um, uh, from uh, this is uh, the, the first competition, right? Okay, so I should uh, I should add two more stories actually before this. So when I finally discovered the Tizita, um, I sat down with my friend I mentioned, my colleague, right, and and another and, and another friend of ours from Ethiopia, and I was telling them I really want to write this novel. Uh, can you help me uh, understand what the song is about? So generally people say nostalgia and so on and so forth, but I wanted a line by line, you know, uh, analysis of the song. Yeah, so we went to a bar and we were sitting down, you know, and, you know, and, um, and they couldn't agree on the first two lines, right? You know, so <laughs> so we, we spent like an hour or so, you know, but they couldn't go beyond uh, the, the first two lines. Uh, because uh, this helps you understand later for Ethiopians, the, the Tizita is more than a song, right? It's more than a song. It's... it's um, as one of the characters say, and I'll read that passage, it's almost like a 200,000 archive of, of human history, right? You know, or in, in this case, Ethiopian history. So how can you uh, render that? You know, how, how can you uh, translate that for somebody who doesn't speak the language? Uh, oh, yeah, and also, you could be the most famous musician, pop musician, but if you sing a bad tizita, it can actually destroy your career, right? Like, that's how seriously they take it. And, you know, and, and families have fights over dinner about who can sing the best Tizita, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Uh, okay, so this is at, 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 the, at, at the boxing club. Uh, on stage, the musicians were enjoying themselves too much and they left us behind. And by the time we caught up, it was to find Miriam playing the accordion, looking so slight and bent forward that I worried about her. And I should mention that the, the four characters are Miriam, who's a bartender, a Taliban man, who does some sort of like, from the name you can tell, he does more like hip hop, you know, <laughs> hip hopish, you know, hip hopish, you know, Tizita. Uh, the corporal who has gone through war, right? So he's, he's very traumatized, but finds healing through the Tizita. And, and, and to my mind, the main character uh, called uh, the diva or Kidane, right? Who, who has to almost like a split personality. One where she does pop music, you know, the other one where, where, when she's in her element, right? Where she sings the Tizita, right? Uh, on stage, the musicians were enjoying themselves too much, and they left us behind. And by the time we caught up, it was to find Miriam playing the accordion, looking so slight and bent forward that I worried about her. But she was at it, pulling, ebbing, and letting out a gentle church organ sound in song, the accordion lungs expanding and contracting gently, 
breathing in and out layered, layered prayers. She was swaying side to side, dipping in, uh, in and out, lifting one foot in and out, and wading out of the river of this visitor that, that, that as yet had no words. She stomped her feet, ran her right hand across her left on the accordion to create confused, upside down rainbows of sound, and then a scissora. The silence trans transfixed the drunkards, gamblers, slammers, and the believers in place. The silence moved from being expectant to bordering on being painful. At the end of that silence, where the pain was turning into relief, the corporal with the Masenko came in and bored a long, devilish, trembling bass, low and threatening. But the Taliban man was not going to have us threatened, and his guitar with its clean, thin sound, note for note, came in. Miriam stomped her feet again, and silence reigned once again. And from that silence, she started singing low, long moans gliding above and underneath the lazy accordion. The Taliban man's guitar was getting more urgent, while the diva on the piano was furious, and the corporal on his devilish masenko held everything together. Then the corporal left his post and came in with the low buzzing sound of the masenko, mourning that was amplified by, slow, by the slow wail of the accordion as Miriam pulled it apart. Her voice with a constrained rasp came in once again. The Taliban man did a violent lead solo. The diva's piano jumped into the fray, playing peaceful but sharp, short, determined notes that threatened to undermine the Taliban man's work. They both went on for a while as we clapped and cheered and clapped to the beat. They played on, helping each other up when one of them faltered with the beat and timing. A few minutes into the jam, Miriam looked at the Taliban man and he slowed down his syncopated guitar, his syncopated guitar playing, and the others followed suit. Silence, save for the low bars of the Masenko and the sound of the accordion slowly turning out, slowly running out of air. She winked at me. This one she said in English, and she bent her voice low and joined the Masenko. When I dream of happy days, O oh, Tizita, wake me so I can find you once again. I fear so much that you, will not, that you, you too will leave me and I'll forget this pain that carries my love. And Tizita, if I forget those I loved, how can I remember who I am? One day I'll be dead and gone, my grave untended, dead of birth and death on my gravestone from centuries past and only my Tizita will remain. Only you will remain. Tizita, what I fear the most is that I'll forget the pain that carries my love. Right? So, so, yes, yes, so, so there's, there's that thing of a... Okay, so if, if you've been in love and had your heart broken, right, you don't... It, it, and you heal, right, you know, then, you know, <laughs> then, then, then it's over, right? You know, so, so the Tizita has that, that, that idea of uh, that... That, 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 that you need the pain in order to keep remembering the person you lost or loved, right? Uh, so, yeah, so, but, I wanna, so, but it's also, because it's, it's all about aesthetics, right? Um, so I wanted, I haven't read this passage before, um, but it's a passage where, uh, you know, where, where Manfred goes to visit Kidana in her village, Right, uh, in her village home uh, in, in Ethiopia, and he wakes up at night uh, because he can't fall asleep, and then he finds her playing the piano. Right, so I want to read that passage, and then one more, uh, then we can get to the conversation. Yeah, I had to think twice about reading this passage. So, <laughs> no, but it's not as it's not that bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I undressed and hopped into bed and, and tried to fall asleep, but I was exhausted. The kind of exhaustion that makes sleeping impossible. And this is Norman Freddy, the, the narrator. Uh, a steep drink seemed like the next best thing. On my way to the kitchen, I noticed the light was on in the small room with the piano and decided to turn it off. But Kidana was in there, stuck naked, headphones on, playing a song that I could not hear. In space and heaven, there is no sound, she had said back at the ABC. This was as close as I was ever going to get to hearing or rather witnessing music without sound. I did not dare to enter to disturb her. So I just stood there, observing a naked woman, her hair down to her back, her statuesque figure shaking gently and at other times violently as her hands moved across the keyboard, sometimes so, so forcefully that I could feel reverberations on the wooden floor 
and have my naked feet. Another time so softly that all I could hear was a light flutter. Sometimes she would hum, but without, without the music, the melody sounded disjointed. It was like watching a painting come alive. I could get why she was playing late into the night, but naked? To stand naked before the tizita, to share vulnerabilities, to feel it on her skin in a way that she could not in front of an audience? Or was it just too hot and she thought I would be sleeping? Or was it my dream? I could have stood there and watched her for hours, but I had the key turning. It was her husband returning. And, understand, and understanding there would be no easy way to explain why I was standing there watching his naked wife play soundless music. <laughs> I took that as my cue to quickly, uh, but quietly go back to bed. Um, maybe I should say it's sensuous, right? It, it, it's about African sensuality, sensuality, sensuality and also aesthetics. Uh, so, and the last passage I, I'll read, um, this is now Manfredi has gone to, he's in Ethiopia, he's in Addis, and uh, he has, you know, it, it, he has met with the corporal, right? And at this point they have trust, at the beginning they didn't, they couldn't trust him, he's a tabloid journalist after all, but now he has earned their trust by his reporting. And uh, so, and it's, uh, and it's now the corporal trying to explain to, to Manfredi what the Tizita is, right? Uh, the soul, isn't that a bit vague, I asked. And then the corporal answers, because it is unknown, we want to call it unknown because that is easy. Think about the first death. The tizita to me, for me, is that sound of the first death. That the recognition and the surprise and the realization. That first consciousness that realized it was going to be no more and you wanted to leave a message. To leave a message in a bottle that becomes me and you. With the tizita, I can feel it. I know it, but I cannot speak it. So I sing the tizita because it will echo in your soul. Sound waves from, yesterday, from yesterday's meeting and perhaps we shall understand something that we, don't, we do not have words for yet. All I can say is you can walk for a very long time and get where you're going, but all along little bits of yourself are left along the way and you get where you're going and there's no going back without stepping on yourself and there is no going forward without eventually tearing your entrails out of your body. The tizita is that impossibility. I am dead and buried. I am alive and well at the same time. When I sing it, I know what that is, even though when I stop, I cannot explain it. An understanding with no words, only sound. Let me put it this way. Historians record history, and even though they are computing versions, it is there on paper. In science, every new discovery and invention is directly tied to, tied to the previous one an archive that is also new. But human emotion, feeling, where is the archive? Philosophy and psychology explain, but where is the archive that we can visit to learn about that first? But where is the archive that we can visit to learn about what the first human being felt on first experiencing love or the tragedy of losing a loved one? The first parent to bury their child. We fall in love and it feels like it's for the first time. We assume the emotion of love does not contain the archive of past loves from generation to generation, all the way back to that living thing that first gruffly granted, I see, I love. Sound, I think the corporal was trying to tell me, expresses that archive, a 200,000 year old archive of extreme human emotion. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, but I, 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 should I should tell you one quick story. Uh, <laughs> so I, it, it, I, I, I was in Addis, um, I think in 2015, Right, uh, with, with, with the same colleague and also another a mutual friend. And we just ended up in this club, you know, it, it was just haphazard, you know, we were out partying. Uh, we ended up in this club, you know, and in there, there was, it turned out Mandingo, who's one of the best visitor musicians, happened to be there, right, in the club. So he came uh, on stage and started singing, right? And we're talking about like two or three in the morning, two, two or three o'clock in the morning, everybody's well drunk. <laughs> You know, but people just sit down and listen, you know, and that's something I, you'd never witness, like in a Kenyan, like in a Kenyan club, right? People just sit down and listen to the Tizita. Yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you can sit there. Okay. Um, before we start our conversation, um, 
I want to uh, say a few words about Revolution Books and invite you uh, to become part of the life of this bookstore and uh, to support this bookstore. Revolution Books is the political, intellectual, and cultural center of a movement for an actual revolution to overthrow this system and to bring into being a society and world in which human beings can truly flourish and we can protect the planet. The beating heart of this bookstore is the work and leadership of Baba Bakian. He is the most important political thinker and leader in the world today. He is the leader of the revolution to emancipate all of humanity. And this is a rare time when the possibility for making revolution right here in the United States, in the heart of the beast, is heightened. And this is a time when this bookstore becomes all the more important. And I want to invite people to learn more about this bookstore, to think about joining the staff of this bookstore. We need to expand the reach and the impact of this bookstore in a time like this, in a rare time. And I want to encourage everyone to read this declaration and call from the Revcoms, a call to get organized now for a real revolution. Um, we are all volunteer and nonprofit. We count on your financial support as well as your involvement, your energy, your ideas from the books that we carry and should carry uh, to how we can make these programs more known to people throughout the city and now with the live stream dimension, the people of the world. So we need you, Revolution Books needs you because humanity needs revolution and this is very serious right now and we have great ambitions, great plans, but we need money to bring that into uh, reality. So I would ask that people consider making a donation to the store. You can talk with the staff. Uh, you can become a sustainer, a monthly sustainer of the store. Um, and you can talk with uh, Jane here. She will raise her hand. And Brenda and Ruby, I believe, are outside. We have an outdoor uh, audience with us. And uh, you can uh, find out more about connecting with this bookstore, connecting with the movement for an actual revolution, and uh, making a donation to the store. Uh, I do have to just say, uh, by way of, of just raw, brute facts, we suffered extensive damage you know, through uh, the uh, flooding that resulted from Hurricane Ida. So, you know, on top of all the great I plans that we have, and I mentioned, you know, we have to deal with that as well. So this is very, very uh, crucial right now. So you can talk with the staff, talk with me afterward, and we are now going to begin our formal discussion, but not before I tell all of you that you can get their two books, Mukoma's and Wanjiku's book, here at the bookstore and on our online platform. And you can go to revolutionbooksnyc.org to uh, get those books online, okay? So we're now going to take the podium. I'm getting my uh, instructions from the, <laughs> from the producers of the program. We're gonna take the podium off the stage and then I'm gonna sit down here with Mukoma and uh, Wenjiko is gonna join this discussion uh, from um, the Zoom position in Atlanta. So just give us one minute to uh, tidy up the stage and we're gonna conduct this discussion. So um, uh, at this point, I would like uh, for everyone in the audience to give our two authors another round of applause. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. And, um, you know, both of them ended with uh, passages from their new novels that were quite beautiful. And I do have to say these novels are, are just extraordinary in, you know, in the poignancy and the beauty. 
and also in the in the, in the in the in the in the scope of what's being you know addressed in these you know in these novels. Um, so what I wanted to uh, I wanted to start with a question. Um, although I will, if I will privilege our speakers, if you want to make a comment or ask a question of your sister, uh, you can start with that. Uh, or um, no, I was, I was just going to make the joke and say, you know, we have gotten older, and so we're becoming better writers. Uh, <laughs> I don't use my mic on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't. She called, do you have a question? Is she there? Um, no, I might have one. As okay, we, well, well, I'll... Oh, wait, we'll get Raymond to start us off, and then... Okay, we'll... I'll start it up. Okay. Um, let, me, let me begin with uh, Wanjiku. Um, you know, what, what's, what's really amazing... Well, one of the many amazing, you know, features of the book is that you're telling a story, and the story involves the telling of stories, and the telling of stories involves the art of telling stories and the stories themselves are metaphors and I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little more about you know how you were conceiving the, of this you know and one of the, the the sort of you know enticing and and sort of curious features of of uh, Aunt Sarah you know who's the the chief storyteller here is that most if I recall most of her stories are incomplete uh, she describes them, or, 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 um, uh, or, or, or uh, I think it, as as orphaned stories. So maybe you could say a little more about this whole question of stories, the art of storytelling, and what this is, you know, really a metaphor for. Right. So um, <laughs> thanks very much. Um, yeah. So that's a it's, it's a huge question, but I'll, I'll start with how I started writing the novel. And I, I should say that, I should have said this in the beginning, but, but we really do have an Aunt Sarah, who's my dad's sister, who um, used to tell us stories, you know. Um, her name's Sarah, not Sarah's sister. But, but she really did exist. And um, we would sit around the fire, Mukoma and I, and um, I think my siblings were a bit older. I may be jokey, actually. And, you know, she would she'd tell us this, um, she'd narrate the stories about, trickster stories, if you like, you know. And... Um, and I remember just an intro, I, I, Mukama and I were, we were aware that I think when we got to our teen years, Mukama, I don't know if you remember, but we, we thought this is really, really important. We need to go and record her, oh, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we went, we recorded, we know we sat, I think one afternoon and, oh, I don't know, a day. I, I don't actually remember. I just remember that we went and recorded her, recorded the stories. I don't know where the cassette tapes, because that's what they would be. I, Except it's our problem. <laughs> <laughs> like nobody would play them anymore. <laughs> it's like with what though, you know? So right, so 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 there is that. And and you know, and, and I do think about she's late now, but I do think about her a lot when I when whenever I get questions like, you know, how did you come to be a writer? And of course I come from a family of writers and of our dad is, is a writer and we grew up watching him write. So I think that has a lot to do with us eventually or deciding or, or becoming writers as it were. But I do think that she did sort of have an influence on us, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I was writing this novel and I was thinking, I was thinking about her a lot, clearly, that's why I stuck to the name. But I also wanted to tell a story I, about the power of storytelling, you know, stories being, uh, the story is meaning making. Like I said in the beginning, I wanted to write a novel about resistance and power and agency and how stories contribute to those. Um, so I wanted to talk to tell about, you know, reality and myth and confinement and freedom, um, loss and love, you know, and play around with childhood and adulthood and how then stories help us or help us to unravel, you know, um, um, the, for instance, um, growing up in Kenya during a dictatorship. You know, it was the stories that carried us through because not only did Ansara tell us stories, but we also had this running. Um, my, my elder siblings would tell Mokoma and I stories about Monkey Cowboy, you know, and it was this cowboy. Uh, Mokoma can maybe tell a story about Monkey Cowboy later on, but it was about this cowboy who was, you know, out in search of justice and freedom, you know, and we would just, I, do whatever we needed to do to get the siblings to tell us the stories which they made up on the spot you know i was thinking i was thinking about all that and how did i then make sense of the world how do i make sense of the world 
how do we make sense of the world? And it's through stories. Everything is a story. Um, so I do want, so I did want to, and, and yeah, and talk about the power of storytelling or, or myth making for that matter for survival on the micro scale of family. So I had Mubi and her family, her dad and her mother, and then on the macro scale of a nation, you know, um, they're living a dictatorship. How do they, how do they make sense of that world? How, you know, and that's, that's, that's where Ansara comes in and through her story, she's trying to unravel um, and help Mumbi determine or decide or figure out, you know, how she, how to survive, you know? And I thought that the, um, the fact that many of the stories from Ansara are incomplete is a, a summoning to Mumbi to finish the story, both, you know, in a literary sense, in the storytelling, but in life in terms of, you know, what the yeah. power of story, you know, enables. And um, on the other hand, I mean, there is what is standing in opposition to this. There is the emperor, right? Mm -hmm. And he and has institutionalized uh, the telling of lies and untruths. Right. So I just thought that that clash is, I mean, you know, that, that, that the storytelling, even as it's, you know, stories that are confabulated or, you know, they're, they're in many ways fictional, but they are part of the process of reclaiming history that has been suppressed. And, you know, the king, right? I mean, is this, I mean, I thought that clash yeah. was, was really, you know, a very dynamic element of the, you know, in the, in, in the novel. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because the empire, I mean, his job is to stop anyone from telling stories. And what he says, what he tells them, what he tells the people is that, hey, let's, um, history is, let's do history. Let's not do stories. Let's talk about facts, facts that he has obviously engineered, you know, written history to suit the history that he wants to, you know, so, and, and he's, so what he does in the story, in the novel is that he's, he tries to, you know, he arrests um, Mombi for, t for telling the stories. And right. the interesting thing is that he's also even, He's trying to escape the stories because he doesn't want imagination to flourish in the nation. But he, uh, at one point, you know, the story of the porcelain bowl gets to him and he's suffering from an illness. And he thinks, well, I need that porcelain bowl because it's, it has healing powers, you know, and he does what he needs to do uh, to try and get that porcelain bowl. You know, so even he trying to resist the storytelling, he can't help but be, you know, um, uh, thrown into the whole um, the storytelling that Mombi is doing in the countryside because she does she uses stories to um, as a rebellion movement. You know, she they they go underground and they're telling stories underground. They move from space to space uh, as they tell these stories. You know, um, yeah. Yeah. So and and Aunt Sarah. Yeah, I'm glad you're talking about Aunt Sarah because. Like so, you have to picture when we're growing up. You know, uh, first, you know, um, we're growing up in a political dictatorship in a neo-colonial dictatorship, right? Uh, at some point, our father is in detention, exile. There's a lot of political repression. You know, getting raided by police and so on and so forth. So then, to have these moments of just storytelling, you know, so as Shiko says, I highly doubt we would have survived without you know, without storytelling. But it also helped we didn't have a TV, <laughs> I suppose. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, but one of the stories uh, our, our eldest brothers would tell us uh, revolved around, yeah, Mwangi Cowboy, right? So he was a badass cowboy, right? A black cowboy. And uh, one of the, so, and when, wanted to start, when my brothers wanted to start narrating this story, you know, we'd be doing something with Shiko and then we'd hear, Mwangi Cowboy, Dage Horeka, Nevi Gari. You know, which means that Mwangi Cowboy cannot be. Uh, it cannot be defeated by the police, actually, which is very relevant today in, in, in terms of the BLM movement. But anyway, yeah, so one of the stories is how, um, you know, one day they actually managed to, to find him and they surrounded him, right? And, and he told them, uh, okay, look, guys, okay, you can shoot me, right? But I want to count, and I want to give you a count of three or four. You know? So, I mean, you're okay, we are very young. Anyway. <laughs> So, so, uh, so, so he starts counting one, two, three, and then he ducks, and then, the, uh, and then the police shoot each other, right? You know, so. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Yeah, but often they would just make up the stories on the spot. Yeah, but yeah. I, I think that's the one we remember the most. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the one we because I mean, yeah, because they didn't they changed every day, right? I mean, it was just <laughs> was it Go Show at um, Kim, and they didn't know who had told what you know stories. Yeah. They're all making them up. But we we oh man, we loved uh, when we heard that song. It was like yeah. uh, this is the life, you know. <laughs> it's yeah. quite good. Yeah. Wenjiku, I want to ask you one other question, and then we'll turn um, to uh, Makoma's um, novel. And you don't have to answer this, all right? <laughs> if if you, you 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 would like to, you know, er, more let the the work answer it. But the title is Seasons in Hippoland, and there is a, an association between freedom fighters and the hippos, and the fight for liberation, and these. Hippos. Um, my question is, do you want to say anything about why the hippo? Um, is this analog to uh, liberation? Maybe I'll let people buy the book. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I... Okay, so we... Do you want... It doesn't have to be a spoiler alert. Okay. No, I'm not... So what I'm going to... I'm going to explain how that... I'm going to explain the context. And then I'll let the, you know, the readers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so the do the work. Mm -hmm. All right. So so we grew up in a place called Magul, right? Mm -hmm. And that literally means the place of the hippos. And the reason um, they moved, <laughs> or they they moved from where um, they moved from Magul, right? Is because they you know the word the word the word chase because people started settlements started moving started moving in with um started um i suppose invaded their world you know uh, and and it's kind of at least in the novel and it's kind of synonymous with you know when the brits came to kenya and you know moved people from their land and <laughs> invaded and you know so um so I, I i guess i was trying to in a way trying to say that you know uh colonialism did not just affect or you know the people it's it's a whole ecosystem that they messed with you know um so so i mean that, that's that's i suppose that's all i all i can say about it you know and there are magical elements of the story i also wanted to play around with that like you know did did the hippos help in the you know in, in the in the fight for for freedom for land because it's also for their survival you know what we're doing to to nature and to what we've done to it you know, ultimately comes back to haunt us. But I, yeah, I, I suppose I will, would do. <laughs> do, you, do you have memories of seeing the hippo skulls or is that a false memory? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have that memory. <laughs> yeah, it was marsh, it was a marshland, right? You know, so yeah. we'll go there to get play, you know, to make pots and that kind of stuff, you know, but I, I, I don't know, I have memories of, uh, of the skulls of the hippos. It's um, interesting because I, I because I I because you and I used to go to the marshland and make because we used to make pots mm -hmm. and we I think we wanted to start a business I don't know, <laughs> you know but then the pots would break up you know after we didn't know what the trick was how do you keep the pots and the things and the sculptures that we made how do you make them last long because they just break once they got yeah. dry <laughs> but you know so but then in the novel I do have you know the, like in the novel there are all kinds of you know hippo skulls and and things like that maybe. Maybe somewhere deep in my psyche, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do, you know, I probably agree, but I don't, yeah. All right. Um, and I think that is an enticement for everyone to get this novel uh, or to finish reading it if you just got it. Um, so uh, I want to turn uh, to Mukoma and uh, unbury our dead with song. Um, do you want to just briefly again say something about Mm -hmm. the, um, the, 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 the influence and the mm -hmm. power of Tzitzit. Mm -hmm. And just for the audience, this is spelled T-I-Z-I-T-A. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe just say a little more about this musical form. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. Because it may be, you know, it's not necessarily well known, yeah, yeah. you know, to people here. And, uh, uh, when people came into the uh, store before the uh, formal beginning of the, uh, the program, mm -hmm. we were playing mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 
a mix tape that you had put yeah. together yeah. of Tzita music. So mm -hmm. say a little more about this since it figures it's central yeah. to what this is all I mean, about. Yeah, I, I suppose I, sh I should say that Tzita really is, the, is, is, is actually the main character, right? Right. Um, but for me personally, I spent, I think it took me about four or five years writing the book. And I spent all that time listening to the Tizita. I think my friends got bored with me because, like, you know, like, would, would meet up, I would be like, have you listened to this Tizita? You know, um, but I, I think part of it is, okay, I mean, you, you, okay, you can approach the Tizita through African American blues or, uh, or Malian blues, right? People like Aumo Sangare and so on and so forth. But, but it's so distinct because it's only one song, right? As opposed to African American blues where you have many variations, right? Uh, but in the same way, you can argue that uh, it's a poem I wrote some time back where I was saying the blues uh, are an indictment of, of America, right? Uh, because what's more powerful than uh, to be oppressed and to sing about love, for example, right? You know, so I mean, it, it, so so the, I think that Tizita is the same way, right? It's it's, but it okay. So so I, I I've written the book and I still have difficulty explaining what the Tizita is, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um. But, but you really would have to think of a people who have gone through a war, right? Um, who have gone through war, who have gone through all sorts of, you know, atrocities and so on and so forth, you know, across generations, right? Um, what sound, right? If, if all those generations who, of course, passed and dead, but if they, if, if, if they could all create one sound, right, what would it be, right? And for me, that's the Tizita, really, because it captures. So, so, so far, the, the form itself is handed down from shepherds, as Maris from uh, forget the year now, but you know, uh, but across many generations, they're wandering shepherds, you know. So, so, so it's a song. It's it's a song that goes back into 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 Ethiopia's history. Uh, but I'm trying to think for me as a Kenyan why that song, you know, that particular song, right? And I think for me, it's because of some of the issues we are talking about, right? To me, it's a song that, even though I don't understand the words, right? It's a song that captures our own uh, Kenyan history of, of, of dictatorship, oppression, but, but also beauty, right? You know, you know what I mean? Like, just good old-fashioned, <laughs> just good old-fashioned beauty, right? And, and the Tizita is not about showing off, you know? I make jokes and say, you, you can't go with Whitney Houston with a Tizita. You'll be frowned upon, right? It, 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 it's about taking this song and the, the singer sublimating themselves to it, right? Uh, meaning that, um, and, and this is why if you are young, you know, and you can't sing a good tizita, then most people don't attempt to sing a tizita until they are ready, right? Because, because it's about, about giving yourself to this sound. What, what happened with me was, okay, I don't speak Amharic, right? You know, but I, I, but I, I kept listening to this song and kept listening to this song, you know, from the different musicians. Until I think something broke, I think something broke for me, right, right? Uh, where then I started hearing the, the voice, the human voice, uh, as sound, as an instrument, right? So in the same way, I could, I could listen to a saxophone, you know, or trumpet or other musical instruments. Um, I could listen to the voice and interpret it, right? Uh, what, what, then also the instruments themselves, right? Uh, there is the kra, which is like a, like a small harp. Uh, four strings, right? You know, so even, even the instruments themselves are not extravagant. It's not a piano, right? Uh, but what they can do with that, <laughs> with those four, with those four strings, and with the singing, uh, is amazing. I, I did an interview with um, with uh, with um, African Centre in London, right? And they had somebody come and perform a tizita, right? For for that, it, it was via Zoom. Uh, and the guy is so good. So if you're interested in that. Um, it, it, listening to him, you know, because it, it, he's a contemporary activity musician now, then, then, then you'll get the sound. He's just playing the cries, just him and his voice, and the cry, and these four, and these four strings. Yeah, I mean, I could, talk, I could talk more. There's also the Masenko, <laughs> which, which is just one string, right? You know, again, and that's what the corporal plays, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, being able to do so much uh, with, a, with a Masenko, with, with, with one string, right? Yeah, so or playing around with theories, you know, like, you know, like between one and one, there's infinity, right? You know, so between two bits, you have infinite bits in between mm -hmm. that, right? Uh, and so on and so forth, yeah. 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 Um, I, I want to, uh, you know, the, the, the novel is very 
is very rich. You learn about this musical form that mm -hmm. you're describing, and you learn about the lives of these mm -hmm. musicians, the four musicians mm -hmm. who are involved in this contest, mm -hmm. which, read the novel, learn <laughs> more about that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one of the things that, that is one very, it, it, well, let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. There's a, it's a, there's a meditation on mm -hmm. authenticity with this mm -hmm. music mm -hmm. and that the music has a, an integrity to it mm -hmm. uh, and a history. And this question of authenticity I found, mm -hmm. you know, very, very striking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at one point I think uh, one of the characters says it's not about living the life of a musician, mm -hmm. it's about... Um, being a musician mm -hmm. and yeah. and and I just thought the difference between living a life of musician and mm -hmm. being a musician and what that calls upon people to mm -hmm. do and uh, maybe you could say a little bit about that yeah so so far as I should say I've, I've, I've been influenced by a lot of music right, uh, right. And, you know from of course African-American music uh, and but what has fascinated me with about musicians is that they have two two lives, right? One, one for making money, right? Uh, and the other one when they truly want to sing. Uh, when I lived in Boston, okay, oh yeah, yeah. So when I lived in Boston, two things happened. Uh, one is not related to your question, but it's a good story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, we used to go to it's, it's actually in the novel. We used to go to, to this pub with a Kenyan friend of mine uh, called Charles River Pub. Right. It was a hole in the wall, and it was a bar that was frequented by Ethiopians and Eritreans. Right, you know, so I would go there because the beer was cheap, you know, and you know, I mean, pretty much. Yeah, you know, but I, and also to commune, right? Uh, but then around that time, we talk about the 2000s. Uh, that's when the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia broke out, you know. So 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 we would walk in, you know, and the Ethiopians would be one side of the bar and Eritreans on the other side. Uh, but I'm, I'm also thinking about how how to think about what's happening in Ethiopia right now because, you know, you have, you know, what's happening uh, in, 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 in the Tigray region, right? And so on and so forth. But anyway, when I lived in Boston, I used to go to this other pub called um, Kentab, right? And in there, they used to have this musician called uh, Joe Cook. You know, he's best known for this song about peanuts. It was a commercial, peanuts, because he, he, could, he could hit like a really high note, peanuts, okay, can't do it. Anyway, <laughs> It is so so on Saturdays and Fridays with this band they will play like pop music, right? Uh, but then on Sundays, you know, and I'll go right there. I wrote most of my poetry there. But then on Sundays, it would be now them just playing the music they want, right? Um, so 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 the characters here have that that sort of duality, right? Where yeah, they can do the pop if you want, you know. But um, but if, but if you really want to see them, if you want to see them as musicians. Or if you want to see themselves as musicians who are giving themselves to the to the craft, then you'd have to find them alone, uh, singing the tizita. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. You know, um, it's in, it, people should know that war looms very large. Mm -hmm. War and wars loom very mm -hmm. large in this mm -hmm. novel, and. Um, um, one of the characters may or may not be a war criminal, right? He, yeah, and the corporal, yeah. Right, he yeah. may or may not be, so you, you will, yeah. you'll dig into <laughs> that, right? But you did pose the question, mm. one of the characters is, can a bad human being mm. make beautiful music? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so, so the story... That's a philosophical <laughs> meditation. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, so the corporal, um, the corporal, actually, that the story of, of his duality. Is, I don't know if you guys know Sonny Boy Williamson. Right? There's Sonny, Sonny Boy Williamson one. There's Sonny Boy Williamson two. But the one that's a blues musician, right? But the ones that known, the, the, the Sonny Boy Williamson that's known, uh, is the one you know, the younger one, right? So he came over and took this other guy's identity, right, <laughs> and ran away with it. So a lot of people don't listen to the early, to the earlier Sonny Boy Williamson. So, so the corporal has that sort of a thing. He has, it, it, has he stolen somebody else's identity, right? And is he hiding um, war crimes and so on and so forth? But, but I think for all the characters, they are so traumatized, right? Um, right. You know, and, and you also you can think of Franz Fanon's uh, The Torturer, right? You know, the torturer yeah. who would go to Franz Fanon for, <laughs> right. you know, for him to make him feel better so he can continue torturing. 
you know but um yeah but they are they're all traumatized and and the tizita for them is a way of of tapping into into a very old humanity right yeah. it's, it's it's a place where yeah where, where where they can they can find their humanity and express it uh in a very beautiful way um but I don't know if the Tizita is sung, I don't think it's sung through pain. That, that's a thing, right? I, I think it's sung through, uh, through love, right? Yeah. Ultimately, right? Um, you know, um, it, with a desire to convey that we are here, you know, that, yeah, that if you're here, you're doing well. I mean, I guess I mean, that's what it boils down to. <laughs> you know, that if you're here, you're doing well. Uh, but you also have this long, this long archive of people, uh, people behind you. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to. Oh, I was gonna, okay. Go oh, go. No, I was just going to say that. I mean, that that's what I found interesting about Mokoma's novel is like these three characters: the diva, corporal, Taliban man. They're, they're certainly coming from pain, and they are uh, certainly dealing with. Very, they're in very different. Um, uh, in terms of their life, they're 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 completely different, right? But when they tap into into the tizita, it's like they're tapping into the same energy as they were, right? Mm. They're tapping into that. So that's how I understood it. Because when I first heard Mukoma is writing about the tizita, and I knew about the tizita, and I lived in Eritrea. I lived in Eritrea during that war that Mukoma is talking about when he started, or after he started, you know. But you know, I was wondering how is he going to do this? Like how? How do you? How you know? But of reading the novel, you know, I, I do think you do a good job. But it's it's like okay, I get what the, <laughs> plug, plug now. <laughs> you owe me now. So I do think you you you're doing. Um, I mean, I think you've done a good job in trying to explain the Tizita that way through by looking at these three very very different individuals with very different kinds and sorts of pain. But when they do sing the Tizita, and especially when they're playing together, it's like yeah, because they are tapping into that hundred year, thousand year sort of tradition of that soul that yeah. makes them yeah, their humanity. So I thought that was you yeah. know. No, thank you. And, and 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 they're supposed to be competing, right? You know, but they can't but you can't you can't compete to see who will sing, you know, the best soul. I don't know. <laughs> so so at some point the competition fails and then they will jump together, right? And then you know they will play together and so on and so forth. Much to the un un unhappiness of the of the people who have gone to see them compete. You know, because in the place where they are competing, it's uh, it's this old boxing club, very seedy, right? You know, it's full of gamblers. You know, as you'd imagine, like a boxing club, you know, converted into a a bar. You know, <laughs> you know so you have all sorts of uh, I don't know, like seedy Nairobi, <laughs> yeah, seedy right. Nairobians there, right? Yeah. You, know? you know, so so for them, they are, they want to make best to see who will sing the best is it? But the, the musicians eventually yeah. have to come and, um, you know, yeah, yeah. I thought that was, I mean, there, there's two paradoxes involved here. I mean, one is the idea of competing when the musical form is you, mm -hmm. you know, unfold it, you know, um, in, the, in the novel is about um, honesty and, sh and there's a, fra you know, honesty and the, the term shared fragility, a mm -hmm. shared fragility. Yeah, and, 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 and here they're supposed to be going at yeah. loggerheads with each yeah. other. So and I think this is, you know, I mean, this is really well wrought in, in, mm -hmm. in the novel. But then there's another paradox, which, I mean, mm -hmm. among many, but mm -hmm. where the, the protagonist, the, you mm -hmm. know, the, of the, the main protagonist of the novel, mm -hmm. um, Man Freddy, mm -hmm. um, he's writing, you know, he's offering these deep philosophical mm -hmm. reflections on the music he's learning. He's mm -hmm. plumbing the lives mm -hmm. of, these, of these singers, and he works for a tabloid. <laughs> so I'm just... <laughs> this, it's sort of a comic trope. And he's working for a tabloid, and he's, you know, and he's sort of, you know, musing about the whole history yeah, and the, yeah, and, yeah. and 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 the the inner soul, if you will. I mean, how did you come up with this yeah, this so idea of the, of and why a tabloid? Why he in a tabloid? Yeah. Oh yeah. So 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 actually, yeah. This is a true story. Um, the, the novel got rejected a number of times, you know, and and one of the one of the publishers who rejected it said that I was too successful with the journalistic voice. So it, it actually read like a, like it's, you know, like a, I don't know, like an like investigative journalist, you know. <laughs> so, which actually should have been a compliment, right? But, um, yeah, so, but for, for Manfredi, he, 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 you couldn't, like for, 
he couldn't be like the most likable character, right? Like you needed him to be, uh, to be impulsive, uh, to be a spoiled brat, if you will, because he's coming from wealth, right? Um, and also because of that, of that, of that sort of, um, because of his background, he can afford then, you know, to to have a, you know, a terrible job as, as a tabloid journalist. But, but it also allows him to see, like, you know, his un unreliability is what allows him to, you know, to go to all these places, you know, and for the, for the, um, you know, for the, for the musicians to trust him. And if, if he was writing for the New Yorker, right, then, <laughs> <laughs> or the New York Times, it wouldn't have worked, because then, then, the, then the musicians would have to present themselves in a, in a certain way. You know, but this is a tabloid journalist, you know, and... Uh, you know, and he does prove himself by writing one story that's overblown. You know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So but yeah, I I, I just felt that um, that he had to he, he had to be tabloidish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I like how he um, he's so tabloid, but then he gets an insight, like right. something deep and philosophical. Yeah, and he's like, like, well, I'm not going to tell this to the to the readers of the tabloid. This is what I'm going to tell them. So I thought that was. <laughs> Yeah, 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 because oh yeah, he has to, um, you know, he's getting paid by the tabloid to write these stories, right? You know, so it's almost, he also has, you know, that duality as well, right? Yeah. One is, yeah, that he, he has to get paid and, you know, have his trip paid for by the tabloid. So he has to do these stories, you know, uh, but, but he also, but he's also really, really looking for something, right? Yeah. There was a time, I don't know Shiko, if I, I told you this story, but there was a time uh, I met a daughter to one of the people uh, who was part of the chain uh, that, put, that, that, that put our dad into detention, right? He was a district commissioner. So I think the first time, um, you know, maybe I think that was his first or second stop in the, in the long, you know, in the long chain of, you know, before they could have finally put him in detention. But she had so much guilt, right? It, it's, it's as if she wanted to apologize to me. Right, but she has so much guilt about what her parents had done, right? And she was politically conscious at this point. Right? So, so for her, she didn't. Uh, she, she, anyway, yeah, and, and, and that guilt has always fascinated me, right? You know, so, so Manfredi has that guilt as well. You know, his parents are part of the dictatorship uh, and um, he carries that guilt. And yeah, and, and maybe going back to the question of, uh, of, you know, can a bad person sing a tizita? Can a, a person like Manfredi uh, tell a good story as well. Yeah. 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 But they were fun characters. I have to say that I think these are the only characters I've created that I'm actually envious of, you know, because, <laughs> no, because they have found something, right? Like they have yeah. found something, you know, um, you know, f for themselves and, you know, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll be writing, I'm like, damn, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, there's a nice, there's a nice touch. The, ty the, the name of this tabloid is the National inquisitor <laughs> you know, we have the inquirer here the national inquisitor you kind of like ratchet yeah. up ratchet up ratchet it up so yeah. um uh i want to open it up uh to the audience if people have mm. you know uh comments questions uh, you know we all uh appreciate and acknowledge the fact that people have had a chance to mm. read the novels except i mean you know, i know of one person who mm. in the audience here who is um been, you know, mm. working her way through uh, seasons in Hippoland. Mm. But if people want to respond to what they heard, the readings, the conversation, mm. want to bring you in, and I have some more questions and comments, uh, you know, mm. afterward. But uh, mm. I'd like to hear from the audience, including the online mm. audience, um, mm -hmm. if any, you know, questions are coming in. So um, mm. it's. Uh, an open mic here. Mm -hmm. Hello. We'll go to. We have our first hand and then our second hand in front. Great. No. Yeah, next time I'll bring my guitar and yeah. attempt at it. No. Wait, get it working up here. No. No, no. Just getting buzz.
No, but thank you for being such a careful reader. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, um, we can go without the mic, and I will, if, if needs be may, people will tell me from the live stream or the projection outside, if needs be may, I will uh, briefly recount the question. But don't let that constrain you. Mm -hmm. Say what you want to say. Maybe you could take your mask off in asking the question, okay? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I, I guess I'm formulating the question as I'm standing because right. I feel the impression of all the story itself between mm -hmm. what your sister and you have shared, but particularly for what you mm -hmm. just have been talking about, what strikes me is how the book itself or the song that you think is Tizita. Yeah. So the, mm -hmm. in the essence of the music that spoke to you, was that mm -hmm. then, like with time, the story unfolded? Mm -hmm. And then did you come into, like I haven't read the book, so I don't know this, but mm -hmm. what, what makes me want to read the book is that you, it feels like mm -hmm. you've touched into something really important for us to be reminded of around this yeah. kind of old humanity that you get to through love. Yeah, so th there's a passage where, um, which, which uh, if I can find it, because uh, there's a passage where the character says that the first time you hear Tizita, when you hear your Tizita, you'll know it's yours, right? Something to that effect. So, and for him, um, okay, so what, can I, maybe I should read that quickly, right? You know, because it captures my own, you know, like my own feeling about the song. Please. Yeah, so, uh, so now they're, they're over the, at, at, the, uh, at the pub I mentioned, the Charles River pub, right? You know, and the owner comes and says, you know, like with great, you know, uh, what is called ceremony. My brothers and sisters, I present to you a new Tizita by the great Asta Aweke, right? So Asta Aweke is one of the major, <coughs> one of the main Tizita, or well-respected Tizita musicians. There was a silence so deep that you could hear the low mechanical whine as the machine searched for the song. I had never seen something like this before. In my hometown back in Nakuru, we love music. And in the bars, sometimes we sang along to a favorite Kikuyu pop tune, sometimes to a country song. So I was bemused by the sol solemn fanfare. It's just a song. And then my world shifted, just like that. On first hearing her voice rising above the clouds of a choir symphony, I felt something in me and whined. Like the sharp, painful release of a knotted muscle, he kept unwinding and unwinding until the relief turned into anguish. Then as the song ended, I was left with nothing but relief, happiness even. Whatever it was, that thing that had, in, that had been in me for what felt like, like all my life was gone. I looked around, and it was as if I was seeing the world in color for the first time. I noticed that, that my friend G had brown pockmarks on his face. On the regulars, I saw gray hairs, gnarled hands, slight flaring of nostrils, heard of coughs hacking in my ears, the low buzz of activity from the streets punctuated by the rubber of, of a motorcycle. I could smell different colognes, knock off designer ones wafting above the smell of stale urine coming from the bathroom. Something in me had snapped and left me, and the same world I'd been inhabiting for years became sharper uh, and, in fo and in focus. I pushed back my tears and went to the bathroom to compose myself. When I walked back into the bar, <coughs> something strange had happened. No one was talking to each other. No one looked each other in the eye. I guess in a way, as men and women hardened by one thing or another, we had shared too much. The owner declared one round for everyone in the bar. The spell broke, beers and whiskeys were ordered, and it was like nothing happened. Right, you know, so, yeah, so, so yeah, so, it's, it's, so, that, I, I guess that was me trying to, to recollect, you know, the, the first time I had the Tizita, right, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully you will find your tizita. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, but, but, but music, of course, is also very universal, right? And uh, I mean, it's the most universal language, right? Um, so, but I think, I think by, by focusing on, on just one song, then I was able to go universal, right? As opposed to saying, you know, I'm going to write a universal book about music. Uh, so it was really just by focusing on one song uh, that, that, that it became possible. The, the oh, yeah. If I may just add mm -hmm. with sure. that piece, um, that was beautiful, by the yeah, way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, not, it's like that the music, in this case the tzika, mm -hmm. becomes the vehicle that gets us into a wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so I just, maybe it was more on the yes. way into that wisdom and how that process it, No, it, it does. It, it does get us into into a place of, um, of a consciousness of how vast we are, right? You know, and, and how much range we have, right? Um, so myself, I, I think of it as, it, it's, it's almost like realizing, um, you know, you're you listening to an archive, right? When I was writing the novel, I was living in a place where there was a cemetery uh, behind the house. You know, so and every now and then I would go there, right? You know, and it was a cemetery that was um, no longer being tended to, right? And, and, that, and that's why the line of uh, one day I'll be dead and gone, you know, and all that will remain will be, you know, this you know, this place, you know, <laughs> you know. So, and and that's where we all end up anyway, right? You know, unless you're famous and you get a I don't know like a little flame that always, you know, that's always on. Yeah, but, but most of us, you know, we've, we do put a lot of uh, effort into graves. <laughs> but sometimes, at, at some point in the future, they will just be, you know, they will be untended, right? Um, so, so then what remains of us, right? What remains of us, if, if that's where we end up erased, in, in, in other words, what remains of us? And, that, that, and I think that the Tizita, so in the novel anyway, the Tizita is what remains of us, right? This thing that has been created from generation and passed down from generation to generation. Um, we had a hand up here. You can take your mask off for the question and comment. Yes, this is more a comment. First of all, thank you to both of you, yes, sibling you. writers. I had the uh, fortune of having uh, read a third of uh, the season of Hippos, and um, I'm just, the comment is the way that um, Wanjiko evokes uh, the landscape and the characters, I, I feel I'm there. I can smell and see mm -hmm. and even taste, in some cases, uh, what she describes. I just want to say how uh, wonderful that is. And um, I'm a member of a book discussion group, and we're going to be nominating books. So I'm absolutely going to make a very good case, mm -hmm. convince. <laughs> Um, my group that we should do both of, both these novels. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really wonderful. I can make a really good case now because I've heard the authors actually read from the books, which is always a treat. And yeah. um, again, um, I've, I've read part of uh, Season of Hippos, and I look forward to completing each of those. So thank you both writers. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from... Um, Wenjiku, Wenjiku, you are you here? Uh, I'm still here. Oh, okay, <laughs> great. great. <laughs> no, I'm listening. <laughs> the Zoom. So, um, I just, yeah, I really appreciate that that comment that you know, she just made. It. Yeah, I, I I was thinking about you know Mukuma and I like, uh, and I think Dosho as well. You know, my other our other sibling. We um, you know we we like. Um, cooking, you know, <laughs> and we like experimenting with food. So I, I did want to bring Hippoland alive and I wanted to um, sort of, um, you know, use food as well in, in trying to explain what it was like, why Hippoland was so alive and, you know, smells are, are really important. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Uh, when Jiku, um... yeah. You know, we're talking about storytelling and, um, you know, here at Revolution Books, we, we like to say there's no revolution without the imagination. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, 
you know, there's a very important role in the storytelling and the recapturing, you know, of of the suppressed past and hopes and dreams for something different, of the subversive role of stories and storytelling. Yeah. And in this book, in in, in inciting rebellion, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you wanted to say anything more about that dimension of this. Right. So yeah. So so the characters, you know. So so um, so the characters dwell in a present, right? But that present is is haunted by the past, even as they try to imagine possibilities of you know like a wholesome future, right? So but then it's so so what happens to Mombi is that the reason what happens to Mombi's parents is that they try to sort of um, um, control um, what um, what the you know what Mombi and her brother understand is happening to in the nation, right? So they're trying to shelter them, but they can't because everywhere they look, uh, this you know red barrets and 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 and, the, the, and a flaming monument that is. Um, sort of um, in remembrance of the queen of Victoria, you know, of, of, you know, of the empire, so to speak. So it's, it's very difficult. It's like, how do you, how do you live in the present if it's haunted by the past? My, this is what the, the novel, that's what I wanted to sort of um, explore in the novel. It's like, how then do you imagine this uh, wholesome future? What are the possibilities of that? Um, can a story, a story, be an embodiment of dreams and possibilities, you know. I, I guess that's the nature of art in itself. But can could I could I could we use stories to sort of explore and help us navigate the present by, um, you know, make sense of the of the past so that we can you know um, move forward, you know. And how how can how can that be done? And how can Moby do that? How can she get herself out of this? Um, this past that is also represented, you know, by the empire and and so on and so forth. So is, that's what I was trying to sort of navigate. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. We have. Um, I just wanted to read um, to both of you. Um, someone is sitting outside mm -hmm. and wrote, "Greetings, Mukoma and Wanjiku." Mm -hmm. I did make it here. <laughs> Great to hear you. I'm proud to have worked with you a bit, both Mukoma and Wijuku. Mm -hmm. And um, she signs it Malaika Adero. Oh. Uh, so she's outside. Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. And uh, maybe you want to send your greetings. And um, yeah. we're very happy. Yeah. To <laughs> I just thought, because Mal Malaika is. Uh, Malaika is my my agent, right? So, but yeah. she also she's this person who um, I'm, I mean I, I'm gonna say it here. She really encourages me and has been really really supportive of of my writing. So, and 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 the other thing is that you know she's also a writer and she had an event, so we didn't think that she would make it, but she made it. So that's really good. <laughs> glad to have you. I can't see you, but I'm glad that you made it. <laughs> Malaika means angel in Kiswahili. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Repeat that. Repeat that. Uh, Malaika means angel in Kiswahili. Angel. Yeah, angel. Yeah. Plus, also, there's a really popular song called Malaika by Fadili Williams. Yeah. You know, yeah, so, yeah. That you also talk about in the novel a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I, I threw everything in I had, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's hear it. I wanted to know whether you've shared um, the, or, the, or you've, you've heard uh, or had responses from uh, those musicians who, mm -hmm. who do the music to the music, to, to your, to no, your uh, novel. Uh, yeah, it's, it's early. Well, yeah, it's early okay. and yeah, it's early, but we are trying to get in touch. We are trying to get in touch with them, but also get in touch, uh, find a way of, uh, of, of, of me going to read with the Ethiopian community. Uh, but, there, but, but there was an Ethiopian musician who played uh, at Izita, uh for, for, for an event I did. Uh, you can find it. I mean, it's such a beautiful Chizita, but if, if you Google my name and the African Center London, it will come up. You know, because he played it, uh, he played it live. Um, and with it, it, so, and he read the novel. So at some point, I, 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 it was almost like I was listening to one of my characters, you know, like, <laughs> you know, that, that's also the writer's ego. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, anything more from outside or? Um, when Jiku, um, you know, in the in the novel, there's you know sort of the reference to the red berets and the green berets, oh, yeah. and um, and you know there's colonialism and neo-colonialism, and maybe you could speak a little bit about you know that um, you know that dimension of the novel, you know mm -hmm. some of the you know yeah. who's who you know who are they arraying themselves, you know, Aunt Sarah, Mumbi, yeah. who are they arraying themselves against? And, um, you know, at one point, I remember there's um, uh, a movement, if you will, almost to, to bring down, I think it was called the Flaming Monument, you know, it kind of reminded me of the battle over the monuments last mm -hmm. summer here. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe a little more from you about, you know, this phenomenon of you know, the ruling regimes and empire and then, you know, new forms of control. Right. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I, with the Red Bears, I, I think it's just, I was, I mean, in a way, I'm, I'm trying to say that, you know, not much has changed in, in a way. I mean, there's obviously something changes because they do change the Bears, but it's like, it's kind of the same system over and over again. That, that to me, that's the point of that. Like, you know, there's, uh, uh, new governments come in and you know and you know i'm inspired a lot by what happened in kenya you know although the, the novel is not set in kenya but you know but yeah but i mean that's that's the idea of that and it's like well you know you you come in and and, and say we're going to do this for the people we're doing that but you end up doing the same things and then in the novel um you know sarah is you know um sarah grows up during colonial time you know and um right. Her mother is arrested. She's has um, she she she's I mean she so she suffers through the colonial times and then they her, her grandmother and her mother are involved in the fight for independence and then in comes the emperor who declares himself emperor for life you know and um, and then it's like okay so Mombi's dad is arrested you know and then and then it's time because it's you know it's this awful coming of age so when she's an adult she's also arrested you know it's like sort of the cycle going on and on and on and it's you know and but it's, but also sarah and Mombi and the grandmother sarah and Mombi are also representative of generations and people who will not give up who continue fighting for um the freedom to be able to to say and to um or, or who are fighting for for the world to be allowed to dream, you know, uh, so to speak. Um, at the, the flaming monument is, <laughs> I always feel like, um, you know, it's it's just it's sort of it's a. It, I mean, it's also pointed the same thing because it's really um, sort of um, it was built, it was given as a gift from the queen uh, to to the new empire. In, to you know, sort of say that um, to sort of forge their friendship or and and so on and so forth. But I mean, it is a history of brutality, you know. What you know, so so when Mombi becomes a university, you know, she goes to university, is joins the you know student movement, and you know what one of the things they try to do is to bring it down. It's like you know, I mean, I think I was thinking about so this is what has been what's been going on in South Africa, you know, when they were trying to say, well, you know. Let's bring down this reminders of brutality in this nation, you know. So, um, I, I, I guess that's that's what that. that it's that a is. metaphor, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah, um, you know, um, Mukoma. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking about co colonialism and neo-colonialism. How mm -hmm. this is, you know, sort of experienced, you know, fictionally yeah. and allegorically here. Mm -hmm. um, in your novel, you're you you kind of. It was interesting to me that you, you, lear, you the reader learns that some of these musicians come mm. from privileged backgrounds, mm. and um, and um, mm. uh, there, there's uh, some commentary in the novel about sort of the crony capitalism of mm -hmm. the first um, wave of mm -hmm. post-colonial rulers, and then mm -hmm. the more globalized capitalism that's mm -hmm. taking root. 
And at one point you say that, 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 the, um, that there's a battle, a race to become, you know, the, uh, uh, in Ethiopia and elsewhere, the battle and race to become wards of mm -hmm. globalized capitalism. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of the, the old style corrupt crony capitalism mm -hmm. and then, you know, there's the more globalized mm -hmm. capitalism, all of which, you know, are enveloped mm -hmm. within, mm -hmm. you know, the, the domination of, of, of yeah. imperialism. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think of it as sentimented exploitations, right? Yeah. You know, that begin with slavery, right? Uh, slavery was never resolved, right? Uh, the, the the exploitation and the and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually writing a book on African and African Americans, so I've been thinking about this a lot. Yeah. Uh, but the whole idea that for some African nations or countries, you know, where slaves were being taken from, you know, they never recovered from that, right? Then to that you add colonialism. You know, again, we ended up with "quote unquote" flag independence, right? Where um, essentially uh, all the, the economic relationships remained the same uh, with with Europe, right? Uh, only the leadership changed. Uh, then now we get to neo-colonialism. Again, now, now you have you know black people in charge, uh, but again, nothing has been resolved. And then you have uh, globalized inequalities where nothing has yeah. been resolved. You know, and and, and and I have to say I liked your call for revolution because. Okay, to give you an example, in Kenya right now, the ruling family, right, they own uh, 565,000 acres of land. I mean, that's like a small province here, you know. <laughs> you know yeah, 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 and this, this, is a, this is in a country where people, you know, every, every election cycle will kill each other over land, right? Um, in the U.S., if you think about the inequalities here, the number, and this is before COVID, and of course, pand the, pand the pandemic now has shown us the the inequalities, right? Yeah, but the number in the U.S. Of, 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 of poverty, it was 46 million people. That's the whole population of Kenya. I, it, I wrote an article where I said, we, we, we can't reform out of ourselves out of where we are. You know, uh, we really just can't. It, um, it, 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 it's hyper-capitalism, right? Where the goal is to keep accumulating capital and so on and so forth. And of course, at the expense of people. It, we can't... It, I mean, I was surprised people voted for Biden to begin with, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, he was a safer choice, but really, uh, but not the sort of choice that was needed to really deal with the structural issues here. So, and it's the same thing in countries like Kenya. Um, but if you want to understand the corruption, even psychological corruption of the sort of African leadership we have, in the African Union building, the building that houses, you know, the, the, the preeminent Pan-African organization of African governments, the African Union, that building was, was, was built by the Chinese, right? And yeah, and I met somebody, I met somebody who works there who was saying that, uh, that, that Africans are not even allowed to change light bulbs. But, but, but if you want to understand that mentality of, like, how, how can you have this emblem of, <laughs> how can you have this emblem of your blackness and Pan-Africanism and then have another country build it? it to, to my mind, it's insane, really. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, or even now with COVID, of course we can talk about COVID apartheid, right? And we should all be concerned about COVID apartheid and, you know, third booster shots in the U.S. and whether the, uh, the 100 million doses should go to African countries and so on and so forth. But part of it is that they, there is also this corrupt uh, neo-colonial globe, I don't know, I don't even know what to call these governments anymore, uh, that have bankrupted and corrupted, uh, you know, the, the, the healthcare system, yeah. right? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, you have this. I mean, I mean, this is a, 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 an obscenity. It, it, it is a crime mm -hmm. against humanity that, on the yeah. one hand, you have these regimes in Africa that are, you know, neo-colonial, which means that it's subservient mm -hmm. to the, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, to the global world market, and you know, they depend on the West for loans, for military assistance, in order to pave the way for deeper yeah. penetration by Western yeah. capital and. So on the one hand, the Western countries are hoarding, you know, vaccines mm -hmm. and preventing um, the oh, oppressed op 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 countries yeah. of the third world from actually developing the, the production capacity yeah. to locally produce them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have a situation where, you know, the goal, the quote unquote goal was to get 10 percent of, mm -hmm. you know, Africa vaccinated by now, which obviously yeah. far below what yeah, it's, what it's, it's needed. And in some countries, it's less than one yeah, percent. And this yeah. is. This is the state of affairs. Yeah, but, but also I do think that um, 
because every election it's, it's the same politics as here we vote for the same people yeah right right you know so and a, a, lot, a lot of it is, uh, is along ethnicity you know so uh, for example the ruling president is Kikuyu so 98% uh, of the Kikuyus will vote for him in spite of the overwhelming evidence right yeah. uh, but part of it of course is that uh, leftist or progressive politics were were systematically uh, you know, removed, right, either through assassinations, uh, detentions, or exiling, right? So, so the voices that would be calling for, uh, for a more, I don't know, political analysis that deal with the structural issues, all those people are gone, you know, they're either outside the country. Right. Um, so, so, yeah, so there is that, there is, there is that a defeat of, of progressive voices. I don't know if you caught what you think, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had a program here Wednesday night uh, with Andy Z from Revolution Books and um, mm -hmm. oh, Cornell, Cornell West, Cornell yeah, sorry, West that, yeah. and it was to mark the 60th anniversary mm -hmm. of the Wretched of the Earth. And part of you know an important mm -hmm. part of the discussion was what is the content and meaning of national liberation and revolution in today's mm -hmm. world. And Andy Z and here at the bookstore, you know we you know we 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 introduce people to the the new mm -hmm. communism developed by Baba Vicky and the mm -hmm. actual you know strategy the method and approach mm -hmm. to make a truly liberatory revolution in today's mm -hmm. world to put an end on the one hand to imperialist domination in the global south and on the other you know to carry forward a, a social mm -hmm. revolution to transform mm -hmm. all of society and the liberation yeah. of women is very central to this and you know this is what we get into in the story mm -hmm. what is the the revolution that's needed and mm -hmm. how can we make that revolution the tools mm -hmm. you know analytically are in the you know in the new communism that's been mm -hmm. developed by by Bob Ovakian and uh, as I mentioned earlier you know we're going to work on you know what has now developed in the u.s that is mm -hmm. you know the actual opportunity to make revolution mm -hmm. given the infighting at the top of the ruling mm -hmm. class and the democrats and the republicans yeah. at each other's throats what we saw last year mm -hmm. yeah. with the beautiful uprising after george floyd was killed the potential mm -hmm. you know the revolutionary potential among the people you know this is you know what we're going to work on here mm -hmm. in the belly of the beast mm -hmm. you know and we make this revolution you know to make the contribution to free all of humanity and to lift this colossus off the backs mm -hmm. of humanity US imperialism so that's what we get into here I just wanted to read something from the outside uh, because someone just sent this in uh, from from uh, looks like Marilyn and she's saying first and foremost thank you for being mm -hmm. courageous and bold enough to create content that speaks for us and is by us. Mm -hmm. This is motivating to see as a published author, what do you feel was mm -hmm. the greatest obstacle in creating uh, mm -hmm. and uh, while creating content for this book? Mm -hmm. What do you feel was the greatest obstacle in creating, you know, while creating content for this book? This is uh, addressed to the two of you. Uh, Shiko, do you want to go first? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, you will pay for that. Um, no. Um, so the what was that an obstacle? I think it's just um, like Raymond mentioned earlier. It's the, it's it's a novel about storytelling, um, but it's also about so it's about a character who's telling stories to this young girl who's also telling the story to us, the readers. So there's so many layers. And, and I think for me that, you know, in, in, in trying to, to sort of make it um, a story that is, um, that the, the people will understand, so to speak, or that will make sense, you know. Um, and it's, it's, it's and, I, and I like this voice. And um, so I think that was, that was the more difficult thing for me. It's like, how do I then tell this story? How do I tell all these stories and sort of, um, have them tell this story that that I want to tell about the importance of storytelling. So I think I I, I had a kind of difficult time trying to um, to to make that happen. Um, and I and then it's also the novel that whose voice I really liked. Like I said, so I I, I wrote a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to um, 
explore every single thing that I, I could think of. You can't really do that in a novel. So I think for me, trying to um, make the, all these stories sort of fit into one story that can that is um, that a, that anyone reading will sort of make a sense of it. I think that was the most difficult thing for me. I think. Yeah, yeah I, I think for me it was being a writer and trying to write music, right? Uh, so, so trying to capture the, trying to capture sound by using images. I think that that was, you know. But eventually, as I said, you know, the more I listened, and, and for that I really had to listen and keep listening until I think the story broke my way. Um, yeah. So, but I wanted to say that, to give a shout out to my publisher. Right? Um, it, it's published by Cassava Republic Press. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's a publishing press based, based in Nigeria. Um, you know, and now they have offices in London, and I believe they're opening one here in the U.S. Because usually, what happens with our books when they get published, they first appear here, right? And then, if you're lucky, <laughs> if you're lucky, a few copies will make it back to the, you know, back to your own country, right? You know? Oh, yeah. So, and it's also been published. It, it's, it's been published by a Kenyan publisher as well. So, while I had that obstacle, I would say it's been extremely satisfying, right, as a writer to for, actually for the first time to have my books first get published in a in the continent, you know, because the audience, okay, it, it's universal, it, 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 you know, the, the audience is universal, but then it's also a particularly African book, right, because I'm dealing with African aesthetics. Um, so so I, would, I would say, yeah, the obstacle, but then also the, yeah, it, it first appearing in, uh, in Nigeria, Kenya, um, yeah. All right, well, I think um, with that, um, there will be no obstacles to your getting the book here, <laughs> and, uh, and there'll be no obstacle to Macomb was signing, uh, yeah. and uh, there's a slight <laughs> obstacle to getting um, Wenjiku's novel signed, but they can get the book here, and uh, mm -hmm. I want to thank uh, everyone um, here in the audience, outside, and mm -hmm. online, and most especially, I want to thank mm -hmm. our two guests today for, you know, wonderful novels and for a very stimulating uh, mm -hmm. presentation and conversation. I thank the two of yeah, you no, th on behalf yeah. of uh, Revolution no, and, Books. And, and thank you for hosting us. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and thank you for hosting us and, uh, and also for, for, for coming, right, uh, for coming and hopefully getting the book, but really your presence is, is, <laughs> is a yeah. good stuff. Yeah. yeah, I do. Thank you so much for, for inviting us. Thank you for listening to us. You know, I can't see, I can only see Raymond and Mukoma. That's it. Oh, really? oh. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't see the audience, but I thank oh, no. you so much for, 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 for listening to us. Yeah, yeah. And right. Mukoma, it was great. It was, it was great. To, yeah. <laughs> All right, great. So again, thank everyone and uh, get the... Um, the, the flyer about the bookstore and become part of the life of this bookstore and financially support it. We count on you so that we can all work together to make the revolution that humanity needs. That's it and uh, we'll see you the next time. <laughs>